Welcome back. Welcome back to the Block Safety Podcast created by Foresight Consulting. My name is Aaron Simmons and I will be your host for the series where we'll be discussing health and safety as it applies to your blocks. I am no expert, but I'll be talking with experts and industry professionals and quizzing them on your behalf. Find our series on YouTube and Spotify. Feel free to follow us on social media. Let's begin. Today, we are joined by Roy Emerson, Managing Director of Emerson Barnet. Roy is going to be speaking with us about the CDM regulations and we will be discussing some of the key safety implications to consider on building projects for residential blocks, including how to deal with unexpected risk. Hi Roy, how are you doing? Not bad, thank you. And you? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. So, uh, you work for Emerson Barnett. What's your role within the company? I established the company back in 2007. So, I am a chartered building surveyor. The company are, are chartered building surveyors. Uh, but we also fulfil the role of principal designer under the CDM regulations. Can you tell us a little bit more about Emerson Barnett and what you do as a company? So it's a bit of a mixed bag. It used to be called a jack of all trades, master of none. But basically we do, as the name implies, building surveys, whether that you know, sort of a pre-acquisition survey. I was doing one on an industrial unit this morning. It can be house surveys or specific surveys. You know, if someone's got a, a roof leak or there's a crack in the wall. So we can be called in for those. We do a lot of plan maintenance programs, so that's going to visit a property. And then primarily we do it over a 10 year period. That's all based upon what we see and what our experience is. We put together a list of the works that will be needed over the next 10 years and when we think that will be required and a budget cost of how much it is. We do a lot of party wall awards, which is under a specific piece of legislation. A lot of dilapidations, which is in relation to tenants' leases expiring. We act as principal designers under CDM. There's a little bit of everything that's related to... I always say it's building sort of structure and fabric. We don't do valuations in terms of how much a building is worth, but we can tell you how much it would cost to rebuild if you needed an insurance valuation. We do building projects, so anything from new build up to refurbishments, maintenance, conversions. So yes, that's sort of our our area, really. Nice. So um, what types of building surveyors are needed for residential blocks? Um, And how does this differ from other property types? You will find that some surveyors tend to specialise. So some surveyors will, will not even touch sort of the building fabric as such. They might be a party wall specialist, they can be a dilapidation specialist. But most chartered building surveyors have the knowledge and the ability to work on any type of building. It's really just a case of where their experience has taken them. It often leads them down a certain path. So you might find that some surveyors will work primarily on high-rise developments on shopping centres and and often they they feel that their sort of their skill set may not readily transfer across to residential properties but because we have a good understanding of most building types most building surveyors could do residential work what are some of the most common defects you come across when carrying out building surveys on residential blocks? Oh, it's it's huge. I mean, we could probably spend half a day talking about them, but mostly it, it's roofs, they're leaking or they're failing, windows which are decaying, leaking rainwater goods, failed brickwork, whether that be pointing or spooling, which is when the face of the brick is actually falling off. Again, spalling and cracking concrete and window seals, you know, they're of particular concern because they, they often, you know, if, if a lump of that falls, it's likely to hurt somebody. Um, decorations, dampness, condensation, structural movements, drainage issues. So that's sort of 
primarily where where we come to but what that then develops into is other issues such as you know if you've got a flat roof they often don't have edge protection and yet people are expected to go up there to maintain them so often as part of the project we are saying well we need to recover the roof but you also need to put up some form of edge protection or man safe system maybe bird protection so yeah, so that, that's in a very quick summary where we tend to be with the work. It sounds like there's uh, quite a few different risks across there. So when completing projects, do you often come across risks that are completely unexpected? I'd like to say no, but yes, you, you often do. I mean, those ones tend to be where you're doing some work where you possibly have to open up somewhere that you haven't been able to access beforehand. And what you were expecting to find, you don't. You find something completely different. And that can throw a huge problem into the works. Um, what, what, I mean, one of the biggest issues there is asbestos. You know, someone's possibly dry lined over a, a wall. You think it's, there's nothing behind it. You take the, the panel off for whatever reason, you can find all sorts in there. So how do you prepare for those unexpected risks? You basically try and do as many surveys and information gathering exercises that you can beforehand. So that's why yeah, when we take on an instruction, it'll all depend on the nature of the instruction. But we will be making a lot of requests for information. I mean, you know, some of these that we, you know, I've just jotted some down. So the first one, depending on the age of the building, will be an asbestos survey. Now, frequently, what we end up with is a management level survey, which is all the management company needs to have. But because we're normally going a bit more intrusively, we will have the Commissioner Refurbishment and Demolition Survey. Fire risk assessments are always useful because, again, in a lot of the older blocks, the, the flat doors are not fire rated, there may be no fire alarm. And, and you know, if we're refurbishing the common parts of a block, you want to try and do everything you can rather than have to go back in next year to then perhaps install a fire alarm system with surface mounted cabling. Um, health and safety audits are very useful because again, they'll tell us what issues are observed by other people, electrical surveys, lift surveys, water hygiene, gas installations. And then we tend to start getting down to sort of the more specialist ones because you have a lot of old buildings that have been converted to, to multi-use. Now, if any of that plaster work predates 1915, there's a risk of contracting anthrax. So we may have to do a specialist survey on that to confirm it. Again, Old paints contained lead, so when we're rubbing down the, the windows or the doors, we have to take precautions there. Drainage surveys, glazing surveys, because glazing needs to be of a particular strength given its location. And from them, we can also say, well, do we need to put in eye bolts for access? Do we need to put in main safe systems? And now, again, what we're getting into is the fire rating of cladding. So leading on from that, what are some of the main safety issues that you have faced or do face regularly when carrying out building projects on behalf of a client? Asbestos primarily because we've, we've, sometimes you just you, you commission a survey, you do the best you can and you'll still find it somewhere that you shouldn't have done. I mean, again, if you've had roofs leaking for a long time, you often find that it's not safe to walk on them. So sometimes you have to put in additional supports underneath just to enable you to do the work in a safe manner. From that, what, what sort of safety implications do you need to consider then for refurbishment and demolition projects? Basically, so I mean, the, the way I would conduct it is firstly, you, you want to have a look at the building. You need to know what the building is and how it functions. Then you have to basically work out what risks are reasonably foreseeable what ones might you crop up with and then you often have to factor in external influences so residents being one of them security vandalism break-ins so i mean in in some ways actually 
if you had an empty building, it's a lot safer to work on that than it is to work on an occupied building. Would you say there are any different safety considerations for new building projects compared with conversions and non-purpose built blocks? New build is, I mean, no, no project is without safety risks, but new build, you can hopefully identify all of them at the, at the design stage. Um, um, the ones that you can't design out and you've got the opportunity of discussing with the contractor who's going to carry out the project. Where you're working on a, an existing building, the problem is you are just going, potentially you're going to stumble across something one day that throws a major spanner in the works because you've perhaps not been able to get into a property to do the, the investigations. Suddenly you take something down or open something up and it's completely different to what you, you expected. I mean, we've, we've come across it before where you know, you've, been, you've been walking across the floor in all of your inspections and it's all been fine because you expected to have floor joists and then you suddenly find out that some of the floor joists aren't there and it's just an extra thick sheet of plyboard going across it. Um, and funny enough, we, we're not, we don't really feel that comfortable just walking away and leaving that, so we have to do something about it. And, and they're, they're the main ones. So, so, so anything on an existing building, it's, it's what you can't see, what you can't find from a document, that's where the risks nearly always lie. Okay, so for those who aren't already aware, can you tell us a little bit more about the CDM regulations and who they apply to? The CDM regulations, I mean, it first started, I think, in 1994. We're now on our third version of the regulation so they started in 2015 and they relate to all construction projects it doesn't matter how big how small a lot of people have this misconception that if you send a chap in to change a light fitting cdm is not applicable well actually it is it you know it, it, it's something as simple as that um one of the main areas it doesn't apply to is soft landscaping but it does actually apply to hard landscaping. Yeah, you know, we had one client who who uses a lot of very high tech machinery. In fact, one you know, one of their roles is to test new machinery, and because it it tends to move and it's quite heavy, it has to be bolted to the floor. And the physical act of bolting it to the floor makes it a CDM project. So something as simple as that. What constitutes a CDM project? So you start off on the premise that it applies to every construction project. And then it comes down to sort of, if you like, you get to a crossroads. Now, if the project is going to need a principal contractor, and you, and I know this is a bit boring and technical, but, it, but that's the way the regulations are. A principal contractor has to be appointed where there are two or more contractors, including subcontractors. And if you appoint a principal contractor, you have to appoint a principal designer, which is the role that we fulfill. And the principal designer's role is basically to collect all of the information they can. It's to interrogate all of the designers and it's to try and assess all the risks that would not be evident to a competent contractor. And the idea then is that because you're still at design stage, you can put measures in place to address a lot of those. The ones that you can't address, you effectively put onto the principal contractor, but with prior warning, and then you will actually, as the construction progresses, you will sit down and develop those. So you're trying to minimise all of the risks and you're thinking about the construction phase, the maintenance during its life and up to the point where it's demolished at some time in the future. Now, if you go down that route, so you've got a principal contractor, a principal designer, you have to prepare a document where you effectively, it's called the exchange of information that you would give to the, the contractor. And the contractor then has to put together a document entitled the construction phase plan, which is his management procedures, what his emergency procedures, his site rules, uh, together with all of his risk assessments and method statements. And then at the end of the project, 
you put together something called a health and safety file, which collates all of the health and safety related to that building for, for people to use in the future. So hopefully you don't end up in the situation we were talking about just now, where you didn't know where things were and what was behind other things. Is a principal designer always required? If you've only got a single contractor doing a project, he's not a principal contractor, which means you don't need a principal designer, but he still has to produce the construction phase plan. Now, a construction phase plan is allowed to be suitable and proportional to the project. So if you were doing a new build, multi-storey building, it would contain a huge amount of information if you are going in to change a light bulb, then it may be nothing much more than the risk assessment and method statements. But in terms of liabilities, the client does have specific responsibilities under the CDM regulations. So he needs to make sure that the contractor has been told about everything. He needs to make sure that the contractor has produced all of the relevant information and interestingly, he also has to make sure that welfare facilities are provided. So he doesn't have to provide them. He just has to make sure that they are there. And again, if the project goes for more than... So if the project has more than 20 people on it at any one time, or it exceeds 500 individual shifts, you have to submit a notification form to the health and safety executive. And then basically that just that just gets logged there. Um, it doesn't mean you're more likely to get a visit from an inspector. It just means that you've complied with the regulations and it's been notified. You mentioned earlier that your company can act as a principal designer under CDM regs. Can you explain further who else can act as a principal designer? And does this have to be an organisation or company or can this be an individual? We do act as principal designer under the CDM regulations and I'm actually a member of the Association for Project Safety. But the regulations say that it can be an organisation or an individual, but they do need to have sufficient knowledge, experience and ability to undertake the role. Therefore, every person that's being considered for this role should be able to justify experience in projects of a similar nature. A lot of people who act as principal designers are those who either come from a health and safety background and moved into construction or construction professionals who've actually developed an interest for health and safety. As I said, Emerson Barnett Limited are members of the Association for Project Safety who maintain a database for all qualified principal designers and you can only become qualified by undertaking a period of study and then passing an examination. And I would suggest that for anybody who's being considered for this role, it should be verified that they are members. Although it's not an essential, it's further proof of their competency and should help to convince a client of their competence. How important is it for clients to appoint a CDM coordinator for CDM projects? If it's a project where they need a principal designer, they it's a duty they have to appoint in writing somebody to fulfil that function. And that person has to be competent with adequate resources to fulfil the duties. Are there any other safety issues that would need to be considered for building projects that we haven't covered yet today? Other issues you need to consider during any building project is basically making sure that it complies with statutory regulations. Depending on the nature of the work, you could actually invoke the Party Wall, etc. Act 1996. So if you were digging below the level of the foundations of any building within three metres or affecting any party structure, you would need to serve a formal notice under that and then follow the process that's set out in the Act. You also need to consider insurance obligations. You know, who's insuring the work while the contractors are on site? You may need to consider the safety of occupants if it's a building that's still in use. And that could involve, you need to put possibly crash decks over entrance points, 
you may need if they if you've got car parking right next to the building you may need to consider protecting the vehicles so th they're just all some of the other side issues that that come up with building projects <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. It's been very My interesting. Pleasure. If you have any questions, feel free to contact Foresight Consulting. Thank you for listening.